Hello, everybody. Welcome. So, I haven't actually read, you know, press releases or heard <clears throat> officials making declarations or um, you know looked in on Sean Kirk Kirkpatrick uh, the director of the AARO um, all anomaly resolution office and I think there might be a towering irony here, and probably 17 of them. I don't know precisely how I could insult Kirkpatrick to the degree that I feel <laughs> he has earned a good slapping about. So I'll play the gentleman and not just invent wild um, denigrations of his acumen, character, <laughs> and activities um, since he's been director of the AARO. Now, in case all of this sounds Greek to you, talking about the fact that a day or two ago, perhaps now, uh, the Pentagon boldly declared that there's no evidence of UFOs, effectively saying once again, uh, in code, right? It's as if they're it's as if they're speaking in an encryption form that only they understand because certainly the people in the bowels of the military uh, intelligence complex uh, these um, almost certainly all men if there's one female in there I'm, I'll be shocked uh, and I won't precisely declare what I think that means, but um, one thing it means is late at night we smoke cigars together, exchange favors, and promote each other's children <laughs> into the conspiracy of wealth, power, um, we're the actual humans, everyone else is little people, um, the police and the military have in, included in the scope of their power the capacity to kill, imprison, arrest, or redirect all other humans. <laughs> it doesn't matter you know, where you're from, who you are, unless you are so thick with um, criminal, you know, like criminals, narcissists, ideologues, uh, the really profound. Uh, I'm over here. the richest scum of the sewer of those who defect from <laughs> everything that is good, beautiful, true, and potentially world <laughs> rescuing about humans. <clears throat> and it's not surprising that you find them 
literally wearing the labels of the people who are supposed to be the world rescuers first. Not, uh, if we have a fight, you'll lose. Um, the place you want <laughs> your most intelligent, sensitive, aware, educated people is the place infested um, with what I've heard others refer to as trough pigs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in the words of Black Sabbath circa 1970-something early, war pigs. Um, those who fatten themselves on the blood of the taxpayers. Not sure exactly what the budget is there, but uh, there's nothing that gets a budget like that. Literally nothing. There's nothing that even compares to it. You know, the Pentagon's off <laughs> in their uh, God. You know, the Pentagon undergoes an analysis, probably yearly, in which they <laughs> um, scramble to attempt to count for the billions of dollars, and are usually off by, you know, 65, 70, something like this. Um, meaning, you know, something like 65% of their assets are unaccounted for. But they want to tell us, once again, in 2024, that UFOs are nonsense. Whatever the hell is going on there, um, the part of it is that's nonsense is mostly the part of it they themselves probably invented in order to muck up the waters and tell human beings an array of blatant lies, including such <laughs> gems as a post-scarcity world was on offer to us previously. We chose war, oil, and gas because it wasn't we doing the choosing. It was the seething mass of criminals you know, in the cancerous heart of the military industrial prison information complex. And maybe now it's identity complex too. Um, the chances that there's nothing to the idea of anomalous objects in the sky, many of which clearly are inhabited in some sense of the word, and not merely by, you know, something, some figment produced by Hollywood to scare or entertain us. And by the way, what is it that entertains us? One of the greatest urgencies that human beings who exist on earth experience is the urgency to know one are there other beings like us that have minds like us or two do we belong to a family we've never been introduced to and that second thing is absolutely certain but must be extended to the sky. Um, the Earth-centric, right? We think from Earth as, you know, we're still thinking as if the universe orbits the Earth. We're just doing it in terms of values and creative understanding. <laughs> it's not very creative, but it's imaginal understanding of priority. And we think, oh no, Earth's the only place. Since we don't know for a fact, which isn't true, that there are, you know, 
that there is life in space or beyond space in an in-between sort of place, right? Um, The AARO, right? Think about think about how that um, encrypted little uh, abbreviation unfolds into the all domain. Wait, is that it? Yeah, I think it's all domain anomaly resolution office. The reason I think there might be a towering irony there, in fact, I'm quite certain there is, is that the number of actual anomalies resolved by that office continues to approach zero more aggressively with every hour that passes. (laughs) Um, The existence of that office is itself an anomaly. But I think there's an even weirder thing going on, which is that the government and certain private sector industrial corporations, technological corporations, are probably aware that since around, this is a very dangerous thing to say, this might be the most, one of the most dangerous things I've ever said, um, sometime around 2018, and some organizations of humans may know something about why, Uh, anomalies in general skyrocketed and they kept doing so Um, a trivial possibly trivial example and I'm sure someone will be able to tell me just why this might be. Um, There was about a six month period during the pandemic. (laughs) In which screaming children. (laughs) No. Um, There was a six month period during the pandemic when something very strange happened for me which was I bought over a few mo- over the period of a few months a few cartons of eggs I think I had seen perhaps a single double yoked egg in my entire life prior to that these 3 cartons of eggs with maybe two exceptions all had double yolks Now, I'm sure there's some egg farmers out there that can help me understand this, and in a real way, right? They'll be like, uh, these were young hens, or someone was making a mistake, right? Uh-huh. You know, some sort of biological farming mistake with the, uh, with the hens. <laughs> But I certainly saw that as anomalous. Um, Imagine if one day you woke up and about every 35 steps you found 50 bucks. (laughs) I mean, I think, especially if that continued for any period of time, you'd realize like something has gone really sideways here. Um, And all of us can probably remember lots of situations where how to put this, <laughs> a little program we had run effortlessly previously now required a great deal of effort, a little behavioral program, right? For example, um, let's say paying the rent or paying the bills, we'll expand it a bit. Something that would normally just go fine doesn't work. <laughs> At some step in the process that you've repeated successfully 7,000 times in the past, uh, it just fails. 
Um, lots of things that were normal to our experience suddenly became disturbed, and I'm arguing that they began doing that before COVID, at least before COVID was announced, and not, not insignificantly, like more than a year. And probably they'd been doing it in sprinkles before then. Right? It often, the air gets a little misty sometimes before it actually rains. Um, and the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office is completely unaware of this, this fact. Or worse, and this is the dangerous part of the idea, they're covertly aware of it. And their mandate isn't to resolve anomalies at all. Rather, it is to resolve concerns that anomalies exist. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think Arrow, as it is um, dumbfoundingly called, Um, what they mean by resolution <laughs> resembles what you know previous deadly idiots have used language to say um, like work makes free for example <laughs> arrow and mr kirkpatrick are blatantly lying about things we have seen, we have experienced, we have known as human beings um, in the same way if I had some ideological uh, or <laughs> um, hegemoniacal concern about a symbolic problem with apples. Um, such that I, you know, wandered around writing papers about the non-existence of apples. It's not that dissimilar. We're talking for thousands of years, millions of human beings have had direct experience of objects in the sky that weren't made by humans, doing things that imply they are intelligent, landing on the ground, talking to the people, in some cases abducting them, quote unquote, um, though let's be clear that there's, you know, segments of all of these phenomena. The fact that there are segments that might be mostly psycho psychological or psychobiological um, does not entitle anyone to expand the segment to everything, which is ex specifically the mandate of the AARO, <laughs> apparently. Um, but yeah, if somebody just got up and pretended no one has seen any apples, and this has happened. Um, it just happens with stuff a little less obvious than apples. And there's lots of ways to attack it, right? If I want to convince you but it also is that there is not now, nor has there ever been anything apple-ish going on, right? There are no apples. Um, I can go at it with, you know, ridiculous uh, rhetorical fallacies. I have been walking now outside in the everyday day. I'm awake. I am sober. I haven't seen one apple. There are no apples here. And some will argue back, well, people have them in their picnic bags and such in the park. And you could then sort of just shift the venue. Well, we're using the wrong language. Um, what they have in their bags is food of various kinds, but there are no apples among that food because that word actually refers to something that doesn't exist. In other words, <laughs> we have complex language about non-existent things. And that's the problem here. Um, all of this concern is about something we have no knowledge of. And 
you know, if you say you have no knowledge of it, that doesn't mean you're not in possession of downed craft, alien bodies, right? Um, reams or whole libraries of intelligence on the topic, the results of many years of study by, you know, dedicated technologists within the military and contracted by them. You can be doing all of that and still say we have, we have no knowledge of it. All you have to do is, is make a department that has no knowledge and then put them in charge of talking about it, right? It's not, there's no complex trick to that. You can, um, any department can have no knowledge. You can instantly create departments with no knowledge of Vietnam. I mean, we have no direct experience of anything None of us have any experience related to that. Uh, <laughs> I think the real irony is that something very strange is going on, not just not just in the sky and not merely in our minds. Um, the fact that some small portion of UFO phenomena, even if we say 30%, which I think is a dramatic exaggeration, um, you know, everything but 30%. I think AARRO is saying, we, we have prosaic uh, explanations. We have prosaic explanations for 98%, 98.3% of the reports we've received. And the other reports, the only reason we don't have a prosaic explanation is that there's not enough data. We don't have enough data to exclude it. But that's what we do. We exclude reports. That's their job. <laughs> so I guarantee you that the humans use data in very surprising ways. Let me guarantee you that. That you can surely be guaranteed of. Um, the number of tests that were actually run to determine the potential for doing harm to our species of the vaccines against COVID that were done is very small. Uh, we don't have the data. And in that case, we pretend we do. In the case of UFOs, we absolutely have the data. And we do two different things. We pretend we don't have it, which, you know, maybe the Pentagon is taking a play from Big Pharma's propaganda apparatus, right? Maybe they're cribbing a play uh, there because it's the same play. We, have, we know <laughs> that, you know, 27% um, of, the, of the mice developed heart disease or had nervous system wreck, you know, like completely, the nervous system falls apart. Um, another 12% had strokes. So we just, we sort of smear around that data and release the product for millions of humans anyway. Um, I don't care what anyone says. Actual science, medical science, takes years to run and has large, diverse, complex cohorts and controls. Um, none of that was done, but it was announced that the vaccines are safe. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's like giving everyone, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it's such a ridiculous idea, it'd be like, Start out by giving 70,000 people a handgun. Do it all at once at the same time. Make sure 68% of those guns are loaded with one bullet. Um, and you get various numbers of bullets down to, or up to all bullets, right? The whole all, the thing is fully loaded, revolver something like 48% of the people, and then um, cock the, the, the hammer, right? So that it's 
ready to uh, hair trigger fire. Hand those out to people and tell them it's safe. You know, physical objects don't just do things by themselves. So as long as, you know, that puts the burden on the people, they have to be intelligent. But in this case, it's random chance that determines which triggers get pulled and where the gun is pointing. And we've been told something that is completely batshit insanely wrong, which is that a, a medical technology previously used only on people who were in danger of immediately dying, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong on that one, um, the mRNA tech, uh, was directed at hundreds of millions of people and in many cases mandated. Yeah, not safe. By the way, um, Mr. Kirkpatrick, please <laughs> resolve that anomaly for us. <laughs> because there's an anomaly. I just think the Mallard couple is really cute. They, they haven't watched them having sex. <laughs> there's nothing cute about that. <laughs> Mallards are vicious around mating, uh, at least the ones I've seen. Um, yeah, the male effectively attempts to drown the female, <laughs> at least in many cases. Um, but there's nothing to see here. Ducks don't actually have sex. I haven't seen any ducks having sex, have you? <laughs> so, yeah, I guess the Pentagon, in response to um, a number of recent congressional hearings on the matter, um, whistleblowers from within the government, deep within the government and the military, uh, a colonel with a spotless record and top security clearance uh, came forward and said the government has long been in possession of partial and whole vehicles, bodies, biological material, technologies, uh, intelligence, and has been reverse engineering um, what they think is non-human tech. And that this has been going on for something like 70 years. I could expand that description dramatically, but I'll leave it, you know, I'll leave it there to keep it simple. Um, sworn testimony from ace fighter pilots about stuff they've seen, tracked, and recorded, but there's no evidence of UFOs. We've been shown evidence recently, although the type of situation was um, an example of one of the commonly seen types. Uh, or two. Um, if you survey pilots, you'll find that many of them have never seen anything. Uh, some portion of them have seen things from the ground, and some portion, perhaps, depending on you know how much airtime they have, and also something we call luck. Uh, you know, maybe 8 to 12 percent of them will report having encountered something and a smaller percentage will report obviously intelligent interactions. Uh, there are literally, there are probably hundreds or close to a thousand people alive today who have been present and spoken about what happened when uh, the government of some nation, and particularly the United States, uh, recovered something that fell out of the sky. Oh, it's a stork. Huh. 
Or is it a kingfisher? Hmm. Yeah, there have been many reports of people who either saw something come down or discovered something. Many of those reports include descriptions of bodies and or uh, still conscious other beings. Um, maybe that's the right way to refer to them because it's not entirely clear whether they're alive or not. Oh, wow, there's two storks. That's crazy. Are those storks? Or kingfishers? Huh. They're both really sleepy. As you can see, there's no evidence that I saw anything. <laughs> I'm here looking. I could take a picture. That wouldn't count as evidence. Reports don't count as evidence. Reams of de FOI'd, declassified material, often highly redacted, nevertheless clear in its implications and statements, you know. A stack, of, a stack of reports that would probably reach to the top of the tallest building on Earth does not constitute evidence to, for the Pentagon. <laughs> the Pentagon is... I mean, there's so many problems here. So the first thing is um, the topic that, that would be classified above biotech uh, the weaponization of, you know, possible weaponizations of biotech and actual weaponizations of nuclear energy, which, by the way, is the dumbest thing you could weaponize. If you have a species that weaponizes that, um, you can cross them off your list. They're, they're done. You know, they either have a near miss and turn around, which it appears are, we tried to do. I've at least heard noises lately. Not sure where they're from, actually. Though I heard intelligible noises of this kind that, um, you know, most of my listeners are probably too young uh, to know what actually happened uh, unless they carefully examined the films and books and so forth about it, but there was an event which is usually in America referred to as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, by the time the propagandists actually allow you to use the word crisis, in this case, you'd better fucking believe there was one. Because what they actually mean by the Cuban Missile Crisis is fingers were on the switches in the Soviet Union and the United States. The missiles were armed, launch ready, and the trigger was half fucking pulled. We nearly bought the farm as a modern species on a specific day, you know, over a specific array of incidents. And... What I heard recently, which I find fascinating and likely to be true, um, is that that event so deeply traumatized and terrified John F. Kennedy and Khrushchev, who was the then premier of the Soviet Union, It, it ruined them. Uh, and so they began to have private communications. And in the private communications, they agreed together to 
disarm the nuclear arsenals. I don't know if they agreed that they were going to get rid of the missiles altogether, but they certainly agreed to disarm them um, because they couldn't. They, they realized that we can't go through this twice. This is one of those things like crossing the street. You get one, you know, you get one chance to do it right. Rather, this is more like trying to cross the freeway. Um, so the fact that you, you know, failed to pull the hair trigger gun isn't even interesting. By doing that, you, what, what is interesting is you learn that, we, that if we point guns like this at each other, they're going to go off. And when they go off, everyone will die. Everyone. Human history will disappear. The history of life on Earth will possibly disappear right? if we fuck up the atmosphere. You don't get two chances at this. And one of the things, you know, Eric Weinstein, who I've been listening to a bit lately, and who I enjoy listening to, um, if you want to learn, I mean, I learn a lot from him, but not just from what he thinks or necessarily what he says, but his artfulness as an orator is quite interesting to me. And often, this is something I notice and appreciate in, in humans generally, um, oratory artistry. Without exposure to it, I myself am unlikely to uh, develop or maintain any degree of skillfulness in verbal communication, and it's something that I take very seriously and uh, enjoy. So Eric was saying, you know, we don't take nukes seriously enough because we haven't had a good scare lately. Uh, and he also says something that I understand what he's getting at, but it's the wrong idea. He's saying we should have rare atmospheric nuke tests to remind people um, how dangerous it is. There's, there's three reasons why I, I don't really buy that, and I think that's not a good idea at all. Um, and part of his argument was that uh, Russia uses nuclear weapons for geoengineering tasks, um, essentially to dig up or, you know, evacuate a mountain or whatever, right? Um, and I think this is catastrophically stupid for many reasons, but what he's saying is that Russia's much more comfortable with nukes than we are because they use them regularly. Um, the danger here is confusing the American people and Russians. Uh, terrifying the American people about nuclear weapons will not help you. In fact, terrifying the American people um, will hurt you in lots of ways because the people who are making decisions about nuclear weapons are not the American people. Um, there's a fragmentary array of processes that I call zombie processes or zombie functions that comprise what's left of our government um, most of that is dead tissue struggling to retain its power and become immortal. And that's why we spent, you know, I don't know, $30 trillion on weapons over the past X number of years. $30 trillion. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, scaring the American people isn't going to help you at all. What you have to do is put... You have, to ref <laughs> you have to kill the zombie functions. Okay? And there's two ways to do that. 
you either go at them directly, in which case they'll probably uh, produce apocalypse, right? Because they'd rather die than be defunded. And if they're going to die, then everything can die with them. Um, the problem with weapons like nuclear weapons and intelligence weapons, particularly mimetic weapons, is that you can threaten the entire history and future of life on Earth with them. You can literally take the planet hostage, and if you get a zombie function that is intent enough upon its uh, immortality and dominance, then they will table the asset. Now here's the thing about UFOs, and wh why the link here. Um, first of all, it's obvious that whatever we mean by the term UFO, and I'm using the archaic term, I'm vastly interested, some, for some reason, uh, probably a fairly obvious one, in humans conducting missile tests and tests of nuclear weapons. Lots of documented uh, encounters and transformations of circumstance catalyzed by flying lights <laughs> and or, you know, ships, uh, vehicles. Uh, sorry, I'm around so many people, it's a little distracting. So... If there are beings that have access to more than one world, then they're going to be very interested in living worlds. Those are uncommon. And they're going to be even more interested in complex, really, in super complex biorelational places like this one. And they're probably going to take the value of those worlds very seriously. Um, whether they are concerned with research, trade, or even war. Um, and hopefully they've grown out of war, mostly. Uh, so... Above ground nuclear tests are not going to help anything. And what they will do is put, you know, fallout in the atmosphere. Um, and I don't know the math of this. I don't know what, you know, what kinds of radiation are humans exposed to by nature regularly without nukes. But pretty sure that the shit in fallout will produce you know, millions of cancer deaths. So you can't just blow up a bomb and not kill anybody. And it isn't just people that get killed. It's organisms, you know, all the different kinds. <laughs> so I don't think that's a good idea um, what we have to do is develop, you know, we need to, um, recapture our own military and the intelligence complex so that they actually serve, um, purposes that aren't lethally misguided criminally insane and provide a means for wealth and power. You know, they're like breeder reactors for the exact kinds of wealth and power that a free society must not support.
The other problem here is that there's so many issues. One of the things I, I've spoken of a bit recently, which occurred to me a little while ago, um, I've long been an advocate of electronic privacy. Uh, and I believe that you know, some, some will argue, well, that, that lets bad actors do crimes with it, with communications tech. And I would argue, okay, what's the other option? We surveil everyone that invents bad actors with surveillance tech. That's a bad actor factory. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my son, I was talking with him last night, and he said, we were talking about black swans, right? Sudden, unexpected events. And um, what he said was, <laughs> you know, there's, there's the sort of British humor joke from Monty Python of no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, but which of course keeps adding to its uh, primary weapons. <laughs> what no one expects is an anomaly factory, right? something that just starts pumping anomalies into our minds, life, relationships, nations, corporations, experiences of every kind. No one expected a black swan generating black swan, right? That one that just starts pumping them out. Uh, but I suspect that something like that is going on at the moment. And I, I also suspect that many of my listeners will understand what I am talking about, even if they have perhaps not thought of it before this way, but hmm. we'll see who agrees. Uh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> so... You know, Eric's very upset that string theory has captured physics for 40 years and says, I think very reasonably, things such as, you know, physics is a horse race, string theory doesn't have a horse. So, um, the horse race produces actionable tech, apparently, or at least actionable intelligence about the nature of time space and beyond. String theory is not doing that, <laughs> um, but claiming to be, you know, uh, a horse racer, whereas actual physics does stuff. Reasonable objection. He also claims that string theory has captured most of the intelligent minds or um, hypnotized them, kind of, right, like entranced them for so long that, that there's no actual progress being made in physical theory uh, or stuff that we could test, at least. Also true. Um, someone else said that uh, some, some physicists complained that uh, they felt like they'd just become subroutines in Ed Witten's mind because Ed Witten sort of the champion, the string theory's champion. Um, essentially just tells them what to do, and they do it. <laughs> right, like he just gives them tasks. Wow, the whole family's here. I think the young male is celebrating his, uh, I think he's celebrating his capture of the peanut. And some of his peers, some of his siblings, are celebrating with him. It's a big moment because the whole family's together and the parents are not particularly responsive because they have to watch the kids. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. 
so I wonder if I can uh, recompose my thread, see how my thread memory is today. The kind you need to develop, by the way, thread memory. Multiple threads at once, far better capacity for insight. Single threaded thought and memory, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I mean, I would argue that humans are so dumbed down in terms of our relationship with memory that it's not only that we can be really easily deceived and farmed, um, but we will not really experience what it's like to have a mind because uh, a vibrant mind <laughs> is robustly multi-threaded. You will get nearly zero in insights from a single threaded mind. So if our thread memory, which by the way is the kind that helps you remember dreams, um, and allows you to pursue multiple topics while still, while hopefully failing to bird walk, right? To full on, you know, go everywhere at once. Uh, so let's see how my thread memory is today. UFOs, <laughs> Eric. Yeah, he seems to think that if you scare the people... Oh, I see. Yeah, I see the thread. If you scare the people, they won't shoot nukes at each other. Even Eric would agree that's naive. I must have misunderstood him somehow. Because if you think you're going to really scare the military and the leaders of our country, I mean, those people are trained to be unscarable. And also to posture as if they're not, no matter what, right? They're just like um, two guys about to get in a fist fight, right? They're staring each other down. You got to not blink, right? Your grim determination must be clear in every aspect of your presentation. Right? But here's the thing, the Pentagon and UFOs, the fucking holy grail of asymmetric advantage the most secret thing of all secret things is this topic, UFOs. It's more secret than nukes. The capacity to either actually table non-human technology in a military engagement or at the very least create a situation where your adversary or adversaries <laughs> which, you know, at this point in human history, let's be really clear, um, nations and their adversarial relationship are the deadliest thing on earth. Um, second on that list is the propagation of machines. Uh, third would be pollution. Fourth is, you know, we can keep going. But that modern nations have an adversarial relationship in 2024 when the future of life on Earth and our species is at risk. And I don't mean sort of at risk. I mean completely. You know, there's a, there, there are 15 knives hanging over our necks with weights attached to them. And some of them are hanging by a thread. Okay, that's what I mean. The fact that there's adversarial nations is completely ridiculous. And the people of our world should, in a sense, rise up together and put an end to that. Like, we are here for each other from now on. That whole war thing, that's from a long time ago. We've got better things to do. There's nothing we can do. There's no more we can do. Not only does that not resolve our problems, it entrenches them. Right? This has to come to an end now. And <laughs> Mr. Weinstein, with all due respect, uh, above ground, you know, atmospheric nuke tests are not going to cut it and will produce a bunch of dead living beings every time we do them. Um, so if we're going to if we're going to be that flagrant with our desire for transformation, the energy, uh, right, the explosive waste of such energy, the lethally, you know, le creating lethal 
fallout on the planet is probably not the right move. Um, scare the wrong people and, you know, one imagines that there's probably some technology that could be employed that would make it impossible to detonate a nuke over a broad area, but it might also make it impossible for organisms to be healthy in that area. So you don't want to get into an arms race at all, right? With the money that our nations spend on war, we could rebuild each other's countries from the ground up. I mean, we could, with that much money, we could establish a post-scarcity planet. But the holy grail of asymmetric advantage would be knowledge of technologies of non-human origin. Um, and that's the most secret thing in, I mean, it's, there may be other secrets, right? But that one thing would give you, if your adversaries believed that you were probably in possession of such tech, they'd have to make a guess. And the guess would be Will our nukes still land and detonate whether they have the tech or not? Can we shower enough nukes on enough? I mean, the idea of doing that is unimaginably ridiculous. It's basically, imagine there was a species on Earth. God, the analogy here is perfect. Okay, imagine that there's a species of humans on Earth. There's a, let's call it a nation. We'll call them a nation. And their goal is, this is going to be fun. Um, they are aware that from time to time, large um, intrasolar or interstellar objects pass near Earth. And they believe that those objects are holy because they come from the sky. And so their goal, they believe that, that the, the reason that God made humans is to attract those objects to the Earth so that they will smash into the earth and produce an apocalypse, wiping out all the infidels and bringing the holy uh, context of space-time, right, and, you know, vacuum, to the surface of the earth. Right? Uh, holy emptiness. Yeah. And so they use all of their technological abilities to build devices that can um, attract or, uh, you know, modify the course of these objects um, in order to cause them to physically intersect with the earth and produce, you know, extinction events. Um, and you have the same exact thing in our nations, right? It's just dressed up a little bit. It's wearing kind of a different costume. Um, and what they're saying is, um, in the event that we become stubbornly aggressive, we won't just end you, we will end life on Earth. We will end, every, we will end all games here. The nations must be dissolved. Um, I doubt they can be meaningfully repurposed in their current form because they are infested with malware in the form of zombie functions that exist to fail to accomplish their mandates on purpose. Um, The Pentagon catastrophically fails its audit every time it's audited. Now, it is possible that somebody can lose all the money in their bank account, or most of it, 
and still tell the truth. I won't pretend that. I won't pretend that if a person is a poor financial manager, we should dismiss their concerns and, arg and rational arguments. But in this case, the argument is irrational. It is impossible. What the Pentagon has said cannot be true. Um, and by the time you have uh, <laughs> embedded structures of military, economic, mimetic, and you know, informational lying. <laughs> a guy was just walking past me and he said in a very strong accent, I heard him say the word meta-thinking, <laughs> which is a great, this is what I mean by the difference between a multi-threaded mind where you have rich thread interaction simultaneously or you just have one thread, which is sort of, you know, a good example of that in media would be Homer Simpson, right? One thread, <laughs> one thread mine. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we can fix our countries and we better not let them walk us to the brink of devastation, but we, the we in that sentence doesn't actually exist because we never forged it. So if we could forge it right, together, um, international you know, endeavor where we, we were like, you know, from now on, we're for the other humans on earth. We're not for corporations. We're not for governments. We're for life. Right? Uh -huh. Organisms actually matter. I'm not trying to steal slogans here. Without them, you got nada. Yeah. Now everyone can see the problem with that, that idea, right? Uh, there's all kinds of ways to politicize it and present it as anything we, we can dismiss by denigrating. Um, and the zombie functions are very adept at this point at the manipulation of thought concern language, splintering human cohorts that might otherwise become communal. Right? Um, and there's always a push between um, tribalism and communalism, also individualism, tribalism and communalism. Right? Um, Individualism turns out to be pretty cancerous because anything that go that's good for me flies and I'm going to treat existence as if I only have this life. This is it. This is the only me, now, here, etc. Um, there's no such thing as UFOs. <laughs> And by the way, the, if you take that statement seriously, <laughs> there's one that comes right after it, which is um, all aerial phenomena are identified. Right? AAPAI. Right? All aerial phenomena 
A-A-P-A are identified. Yeah, A-A-P-A. <laughs> and then it's a, it's a short step from that to all phenomena are identified. This guy switched up so hard. <laughs> now, I guess there's an intellectual hegemony there. Because if all phenomena are identified, then the purview of language, science, and the military is infinite, right? <laughs> we know what everything is. We know what everything does. We know where it comes from, what it's for. None of that is true, right? Um, so if you simply look at the implication web for there are no UFOs, we have no knowledge of this, there's no evidence, um, it's weird that, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's weirdly interesting that the organs of, um, military and political propaganda crib from stuff like, um, the four horsemen. There's no evidence of God. And I guess the Pentagon thinks that if there's no evidence of God, we could say there's no evidence of anything. Um, there's actually no evidence of aircraft themselves. <laughs> uh, things don't fly. Um, birds are doing something we should call travel, not flight. And anything that appears to be in the sky is either a star, a bird, an airplane, or a balloon, you know, or, you know, something made by humans, right? a known thing. Um, and I got to tell you, I've seen things in the sky that are definitely not known things, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, the humans might capture them in the... Uh, They might, they might try to capture them with um, spurious nomenclature that pretends to know what those things are. Uh, it has nothing to do with what those things are. Uh -huh. The UFOs aren't real. There's no evidence. I mean, I, like I said, I haven't seen the press releases or listened to speeches. I've only kind of heard through the textual grapevine that the Pentagon said, nothing, nothing to see here, folks. Um, which, if they had departments that were in possession of, even intelligence about, <clears throat> non-human uh, activities and characteristics, that by itself would be an asymmetric mil military advantage, which again is the holy grail of having a military at all. And it'd be quite easy to keep that sealed up in little pockets of the de Defense Department and private contractors as Colonel David Grush has publicly stated um, emphatically, explicitly, this is happening. These people who work in programs associated with this have brought it to my attention and the attention of others. Um, so somebody's lying here and it seems like it's Arrow, Kirkpatrick and the Pentagon. And I kind of feel sorry for whichever, um, 
for whichever scapegoat was selected by the Pentagon to blatantly lie to the American people and to history and to the future about a topic that is fundamental to our human nature. Are there other intelligences in time space? Do we have access to them? Do we belong with them? Are they our lost family? Did they create us? Did they influence our development? Did they have any effect or influence on the development of life on Earth? What would it be like to meet a species that was actually intelligent rather than aping it the way ours does? At the species level, we are clearly not intelligent. And the more we become quote unquote civilized, the less intelligent our species has become. Technically facile, wisdom score, you know, 0.03 of a hundred. Uh, at, the, at the species level, at the group level, we are thoroughly captured by problems in representational cognition that lead to and demand the formation of zombie functions that run as corporations, nations, military industrial information complex, prison complex, so forth. Facebook, Twitter, Google, the Department of Defense, black projects in there. And once they're free of oversight, let me be very clear, once free of oversight, and if they can maintain freedom from oversight, they can establish a second nation. And with the flip of a switch, this country could become a prison. Not that the oversight is particularly intelligent, You're making, we're making the pie of our government with poison ingredients is the problem. And that's been going on for a long, long time. And nobody's been bold enough to interrupt that. And if anyone tried um, by themselves, they'd probably just be assassinated. So it's not really the kind of thing you can just go up against and win. But what you can do is affect a sea change, right? That's so dramatic. And so everyone wants in on the new, the new path that the old thing dissolves on the vine. That seems a reasonable goal. So Eric's upset because he thinks we need to get off planet. And <laughs> I want to be really clear about a few features of that. First of all, if you were guarding time space, if you were like, you know, Living planets are good things, and we'd like to protect those because they're very rare, and they're full of all kinds of richness, including the ability for, perhaps, for something resembling a soul to incarnate, right? A web of complex forms for souls to incarnate. <clears throat> this is good. We need this. So we protect this. Uh, if there are beings concerned with protecting living resources, which would probably be one of the most intelligent concerns a species could have, presuming there are other species in time space, uh, they would absolutely not want to let modern humans free from the earth. We must, <laughs> they would need to keep us in this Petri dish for sure. Um, maybe at nearly any cost uh, right now, because we have failed to develop intelligent societies. Um, we will burn down the living planet to make war machines, and then we will snuff it with them if nothing intervenes. I'm going feral. That's all there is to do.
Hmm. So, <clears throat> they might utilize an advanced form of encryption to keep our species from discovering the keys to physics. And in the same way, I would argue that it would be absolutely apocalyptic if humans had free energy right now. Um, and it may be apoc apocalyptic if they don't too. <laughs> it's not clear which choice is gonna actually work there, if any. Um, you have to get them to establish intelligent collectives and to establish the kind of hygiene that isn't doctrinal, dogmatic, or declarative um, that produces and supports relational prodigy and superfunction. And by giving such amazing rewards, nobody wants to defect is one way to get there. Um, and that's an achievable. It's instantly achievable with a small group of people. It's even more achievable over a small period of time. But uh, this, the topic of encryption is really fascinating to me and always has been. I I was rather hyperlexic as a child, and I think I'm not overstating it, and I'm not really understating it. Um, I had a facility for language, and <laughs> if my parents had introduced me to children from other countries that spoke other languages, I'm sure I would have become a polyglot. But I had no exposure to other languages. And the one that really fascinated me that I wanted to pay attention to was Latin. But again, I had no tutors. The reason I bring this up is I read a lot of science fiction when I was young and I was interested in codes by the time I was five or six. So <laughs> to give you an example of how what it was like to be in Darren's mind as a child. If I developed some wild romantic, uh, and by the way, romance was heroic rather than sexual when I was a kid. If I developed some wild romantic fascination with a girl in my class, um, eventually, if I got brave enough, she might receive a note from me. But the first note would be a codex. So I would essentially create 24 symbols to stand for the letters in English. And then, then I would write her and I would give her the codex and then I would write her a note and send it to her. so that our conversation was private. Or at least there was a good chance it would remain private. Somebody getting the piece of paper with a note on it would be unlikely to be able to read it. Back then, for sure. Today, much, much, you'd have to have much better code. Um, but I was interested in codes and, and something resembling encryption as a child. Uh, which we might <laughs> which might suggest um, various specializations as an adult, possibly in, say, military intelligence, if I believed, particularly if I believed in any way in, if I was, say, patriotic, for example. It's very difficult to be patriotic to something that's infested with parasitic criminals. And the fact that our country is the least infested doesn't impress me. Because again, we're looking at, you know, 
um, biological brinksmanship here on Earth, and we have been for quite some time. And Eric's right that nobody's paying attention much to that, and we should pay a lot more. Uh, but I don't think his idea of air nuking the planet, which, by the way, let's be really clear about something. Since we invented, since the in invention of atomic weapons, there have been over 2,000 detonations on the surface of the Earth. And it doesn't really matter if they were in the ocean or the sky or underground or where they were. That's a full-scale nuclear war. And all of the costs implied, right? The beings died. They're still dying from it. Um, the earth was strewn with radioactive fallout, you know, equivalent to what might be produced by a similar number of impact events from any objects from space. Once again, it's as if the humans aren't satisfied with atmosphere. They want hard vacuum down here on the surface of the earth. And if you disagree with me, or if we get stressed out at each other as nations, and we aren't even humans, we will bring hard vacuum to the surface of the planet. It's really hard for me to agree with any system that has that ability or would table a threat like that. It can't be human. That is not human. I don't care what your fucking argument is. Um, so there are no non-human intelligences, and yet our species appears to be fascinated by producing the resemblance of them in things we call nations and corporations. <laughs> Gee, I wonder, are we cargo culting much? Right? Are we building something we remember having seen before? Um, where did the urge to destroy life on Earth how does that even arise in an organism? You have to be so profoundly dissociated in bullshit arguments and so forth um, to even, I mean, no one would sit down to the table. and plan the end of organisms on Earth, except our species would and does. And pissed off individuals and possibly religious fanatics are really interested in shutting, you know, pulling that switch. And we have nothing to compete against. There's nothing impeding that. <laughs> we have fully developed uh, war and tech we have completely failed to develop human communication, cooperation, intimacy, awareness, intelligence. There's nothing intelligent about the way our species acts at the group level. Organized, yes. Intelligent, no. So we, we've got to go after that problem somehow. And even if we can't fix it at the scale of the world, we have to train each other to begin to form um, coherent, communal intelligences. Uh, this is the future of our species if we have one. Um, there's no evidence. In another talk, I told the story of an engineer who went to a company that was researching um, technologies that would, for example, uh, possibly be useful in producing any gravity. <laughs> uh, or we could you know, positively call it levitation. And uh, what was his name? I wonder if I can remember. I can't remember certainly enough, <laughs> so I won't make a guess. Um, I listened to an interview with him probably from the 70s, a few weeks ago. And, uh, he said they were burning up capacitors, like $400 capacitors, 40, 50 of them a day, um, in this experiment, and he went home and 
you know, cobbled together. He was a, he was sort of a closet, you know, garage tech. Um, I was interested in uh, questions about electromagnetism, frequency, plasma, so forth, right? This is the stuff that physics would be unlocking if they weren't captured by string theory. And by the way, I think um, string theory would be an excellent plot uh, to ensure that humans didn't get, you know, didn't get off planet. Um, and Eric thinks of it this way, too. He's like, you know, string, string theory could be what kills us, right? Because if we can't get off planet, we're going to die. <laughs> you know, we're going to be dead here momentarily. There's no way we can survive the game theoretic bullshit we have set up. So if we can't get off planet, all of us are going to die. Whereas if we could get off planet, at least some of us will survive the game theoretical snuffing um, that happens here on Earth. And he's not wrong, but he's not right either. Because you can't... <laughs> You can't let humans as they exist at present infect space-time. They will build machines that build machines. And if that's not snuffed immediately, that becomes a war universe, a dead universe. <laughs> uh, that stuff can spread exponentially fast, particularly if it's possible to instantaneously travel between stars, which I presume it probably is. You'll say, oh, that's against the laws of physics. No, it's against the current state of human knowledge of physics, which, let's face it, is fucking preschool because we've only, we've only had physics for something like a few hundred years or something, right? So whenever I hear someone say, that's against the laws of physics, there's nothing to... Those people have zero understanding of laws or physics. <laughs> They're just not even... It's an irrelevant statement of moronic ignorance. You know, bad, bad ignorance. It's against the laws of physics. Yeah. They forget that science is like a few hundred years old. At least modern science is. Um... I've, been, I've become concerned with a specific problem in human cognition, which is it's possible to produce processes um, in human culture and in societies uh, such as ours, right? Modern, circa our time society that attack foundational features <clears throat> of our biology cognition, um, relational behavior, and that essentially feed on them. Right? Um, they consume resources. Something similar happens in us as children when we acquire language. Uh, the process of enlanguaging uh, invents assets in our nervous systems, in our brains, and structures other assets in such a way that it deprives us of something fundamental that we see is still alive in children. Play and creativity, imagination, uh, not taking themselves too seriously, and so forth. And you can see this dying out in the eyes of children as they get older. Less so in the eyes of children that are raised fairly, uh, but, but catastrophically in the eyes of children that are raised in cities, for example. It's just, shit just goes away. So you can attack assets that are fundamental to, to our humanity, and you can shunt them into processes that are dead inside and our societies and corporations and governments and institutions 
are very busy doing this. And what that means is that they are inherently attacking and replacing with representations every feature of our humanity they can possibly imagine capturing. Um, this has now become extended to the capture of what we are calling intelligence, which isn't actually intelligence, even if it's doing what we think it's doing, which it surely isn't. Uh, but what we have captured is the capacity to manipulate representations associated with intelligence in language. We associate the manipulation of representations, such as language itself, with intelligence. And we think because it's not obvious that other organisms do this, they must not be intelligent. Yet we discover um, often that we are wrong about this. They are capable of doing it. They don't choose to do it. They're also kind of not made for it. Um, I'll agree, right? It's not just that they, they choose, uh, they decline, right? The seagull's life um, context uh, probably doesn't incline it to the computation of, you know, Hamiltonians. <laughs> um, no fault of the seagulls. It doesn't need to build weapons or aircraft. Uh, ah, yes. So the humans build these sort of behavioral and cognitive algorithms. And they establish institutions. But the problem is that the institutions um, <laughs> well, they often start out half phony, and if they don't become almost completely phony fairly quickly, if they accomplish their mandates, Most of those will dissolve, which means that the power and money that was entrenched there will become concentrated and crystallized into a few individuals or a very small group. And then that group will become zombie vampires, right? They, uh, they create human zombies by giving them jobs and they suck the life energy out of them in return for pay. Um, wherever the jobs are not brilliant and exciting and amazing, which some places they can be, at least briefly. We have the capacity to produce coherent, um, amazing human intelligent behavior. Um, the field is dominated by hungry parasites that are, you know, that are ag aggressive hungry parasites. And, you know, we, we, perhaps we're awaiting the birth of some kind of leader that doesn't merely guide us into um, the experience of forming coherent, intelligent, team-like unities and solving lethal problems, which I think our species is totally made for this. If anyone got this started in any reasonable way that could be self-correcting and had sort of mimetic hygiene, right? We're not going to get, this isn't going to become a doctrine. We're not going to form cults. We're going to actually solve problems, including the problem of the concentration of power in minorities um, and the concentration of you know, particular forms of behavioral pathology in our institutions, right? So that the institutions dissolve, but our integrity doesn't go with them. So we just keep reforming institutions that are integral and then dissolving them and reforming them 
so that they don't crystallize and you can't, you won't want to get the ugly stuff running, right, as protocols. You'll give up on, we could give up on that. It's far too expensive. There's too many of us to do that anymore. Um, that may change, we'll see. But yeah, there's no evidence of UFOs. I just think that's hilarious. Uh, the, the scope and context for this topic has radically altered itself um, since the initial interviews and statements given by Colonel David Grush after giving, I think, a 14-hour evidentiary presentation to the Inspector General um, of, I think, the Defense Department. And uh, at the time, the word from the Inspector General was you know, these are, this is serious, We're gonna ha we will look into this. Apparently they looked, saw their own shadow, shut the door, and started making announcements. <laughs> you know, my own perspectives are not merely from media. They, they come from direct experience of non-human intelligence. And the reason why statements like those of the, from the Pentagon are completely ridiculous isn't merely the hundred thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of witnesses over thousands of years of human time. I mean, there are, fo there are images of UFOs in the sky from hundreds of years ago, maybe from thousands of years ago, possibly from, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. There's no way, there's nothing, there's no there there impossible for that to be true. Um, and again, libraries of declassified documents clearly demonstrating the interest and dominance of the American military over the topic over at least 50 years, probably more like 70. Um, and of course, the problem is that there's a, there's a worse problem, which is that <clears throat> if you if you were to send if you were to assemble from human beings a team, and this is probably a useful thing to do or to attempt. If you were to assemble a team to act as the emissaries of our species to other intelligent species, um, you would be insane if that team was comprised of members of the government and the military. These would be the least likely humans to be intelligent enough and um, humble enough to represent our, our planet to other, presuming that humans could represent our planet anymore, they, they once might have, um, to other intelligences or other beings or other physical beings in some way resembling us, like capable of something. I think most of those beings are going to think like, um, these people are so crippled that they've lost the capacity for clairvoyance and telepathy. So, you know, um, they're, they're a little bit like automatons with wood in the brain. Their brains have crystallized into representation. Mm. 
representational cognition. And so um, you would deal with them very carefully. They would be uh, mostly what, who you would want to talk to are not the adults. There might be some adults among them um, who are still alive in the mind, and you might want to talk to those. Uh, but other than that, what you'd want is to talk to their children, because that's the only place where you'd get access to something resembling the intelligence that's um, the, the form of the animal is carrying as a potential but wiping out with representational cognition at its earliest convenience. <laughs> and the hilarious thing about the humans, the big joke, is that they think they're giving their children intelligence when they give them... <laughs> when they... <laughs> Jesus, what a nightmare. Um, it's like you think you're giving your kid a helium balloon, but you're actually giving them an anvil. Uh, there's no lift. They think they're giving their kids wings by teaching them representational cognition. But they don't think that because that's the intelligent thing to do. They think that because that's the dominating pathology on their world. That's the problem. So yeah, they would not want, it'd be almost useless to talk to adults. I mean, our people are suffering. Such a catastrophically self-accelerating array of decogn, like decognizing, which is you, it's the process I was talking about earlier. You take features of our humanity, you split them off, represent them, steal them from the people, then sell them back images of the lost resource. Um, and we might live lives largely free of immediate more free of immediate danger, harm, and illness than ever before in human history, while at the same time being dead inside. We got safety at the cost of the annihilation of our interiority and the ecologies of the planet. Um, and it's not actually safe because at any moment, you know, a sequence of 10 button pushes can end everything that ever was here. Just turn it into hot dust, you know? So that's a pretty weird success story. Um, ironic as fuck. <laughs> IAF. <laughs> Anything that attacks what we, what we, what we use to evaluate with Anything that goes after the resources in cognition or thought or our group communication. Um, anything that, that goes after the resources that we rely on to navigate in identity, meaning, relation, reality, quote unquote. Um, whatever goes after that stuff first is a crime that can hide its own evidence. Right? Anything you can capture that way, you can capture all of it. You can bank those captures and use the resulting resources to uh, 
reiterate the process, right? Run, run this one more time. This time let's capture 90% of the interiority of the humans. Okay. Represent it, sell them back the empty wrapper. Um, call it Lord of the Rings, the movie. Okay. I'm very fond of the stories written by Tolkien. In fact, um, one of the codicils I once, I twice sent to women I had crushes on were uh, <laughs> sorry, I was <laughs> actually having memories. <laughs> Two of the codicils I sent to women I had terrible romantic crushes on were written in Elvish. Right, because once I realized, oh, there's other, you know, there's other ways to encrypt this that are more creative than Darren making some geometric symbols. But that's what I did at first. You know, when I was like six or seven, I'd make sheets of symbols, one for each letter. Encryption. Yeah, the funny thing is... <clears throat> There are many ways to distort human cognition such that the assets we'd use to detect the distortion are compromised first. And once that's done, the <laughs> zombie functions responsible for doing that are free, right? As long as there's no UFOs, the Pentagon is free to do whatever the fuck it wants. Okay. Whereas if there are UFOs and the Pentagon, some organ of the Pentagon, okay, highly compartmentalized, let's be clear about this, so you can hide anything. Once you've got just a few compartments, you can hide anything. You've got a thousand compartments, you can hide everything. Um, they're free to do whatever the fuck they want. And if they have anything resembling a highly efficient system of, of generating energy, or a highly efficient technology with which they can carve out rock underground, then they can do amazing things. There could be a second nation underneath this one that, we, that we're not aware of. And a number of people have suggested that there is. Uh, and I suspect there's evidence for this in So I, I suspect that one place we could look for this evidence. Oh, it's really weird. Oh, I see. Interesting. Um, <laughs> so supposedly there are systems of underground monorails and vast underground complexes um, underneath various military bases and elsewhere. <laughs> a little boy just walked past me and he's figured out that he can raise both eyebrows at strangers to get a smile and I haven't seen any child doing that in a while but he was we were like doing the eyebrow raising game back and forth to each other which is really fun and trippy <laughs> this is nice to see someone who's still alive in there right? you know. um so yeah, with enough compartments, you can hide anything. And once you can, once you can attack the stuff that... That people use to evaluate, right? If you can go after people's threat detectors and their opportunity detectors in such a way that the whole field quiets down, you can get away with anything forever from then on. I mean, everything you can possibly imagine. Because as you degrade <clears throat> the um, observational 
intelligences and abilities in any uh, <laughs> in any parasitic prey group. <laughs> Your freedoms explode therefrom. Humans are very clever and when they're dissociated from being human and it's pretty easy to get them into that state um, offer perverse incentives right? uh, you know this is a completely hypothetical cartoon but um, Well, I don't, it's funny, I don't want to actually paint the picture that I was envisioning. Maybe I can make a, uh, all right, let's say that someone you can't stop, right, um, a nation, and there, neither is there any way you can expose them, so <clears throat> they come to you and they say, uh, They've got a plan. They're going to put slow poison, slow acting poison, in 87% of the foods at, at your local grocery store and all the others. And uh, <clears throat> they offer you the opportunity to be the agent that selects and applies the poisons. They will test to make sure you've done this and they'll do something extremely nefarious and painful to you if you don't. Um, so it's like either, either we do it or you do it. Um, at least if you do it, you know it's going to be done. At least if you do it, you'll, you could perhaps reduce the amount of harm done to, you know, innocent people who we must imagine are not engaged in any active conflict with the uh, poisoner. And it's certainly not off the table that pharmacological companies wouldn't either support such an endeavor directly, because it's going to produce millions of new patients per year. Stocks will go through the roof, especially because we've, we will make them sick and we will cure them, right? Um, so as long as your, your sick making doesn't get found out, the, the curing becomes unimaginably lucrative very quickly. But yeah, we, we live in a situation where humans are perversely incentivized to defect from humanity and this becomes institutionalized, uh, becomes a way of life over time. And it's part of the disease that is inside and uh, <laughs> infects colonizing nations, right? Um, this is a disease we've inherited from ancestral insanity uh, and pillaging. The people who came and wiped out the indigenous cultures of the Americas uh, had themselves been completely compromised prior to engagement. They were no longer human. Um, 
And the mistake that the indigenous peoples probably made again and again was to huh, suppose that they were human. I think those peoples thought that their humanity was somehow encrypted and would eventually surface and become obvious. And since they have these capacities to make objects we cannot make, maybe they have been in touch with divine beings, which is even possible, but it must have been the wrong ones because the result of that was horrible. You know, there's an apocryphal story that um, the, the military has had a number of sort of meetings with non-human intelligences and uh, one of them offered a post-scarcity planet um, with free energy but no war and the other one offered them weapons and they took the second one. Uh, you know, again, this, this goes back to the thing between Khrushchev and uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy. They knew we have to stop this here now or both of our peoples will die for certain. And they tried. And this is probably among the top reasons, if not the primary reason, why Kennedy was assassinated by uh, compartments within our own government. Hard to imagine a foreign power that would want to assassinate a guy who's going to disarm the arsenals. <laughs> um, that's the kind of thing where your homegrowns are the problem because they depend for their power and the longevity of their, what would you call it, legacy. Right? When these guys die, they hand shit off. When they, when they retire, they hand stuff off to others and they reap monumental benefits for them, their families, their friends, their children from doing so. So it's sort of a wealth and power factory. Nobody wants that to come to an end. They're going to do anything they can to keep that from happening. Again, perverse incentives for defection from humanity. And anything that goes after what we used to detect, like if you can infect the stuff that humans use to determine, for example, identity, right? then they're going to go nuts, first of all, because they won't be able to do what humans naturally do, um, which is to detect and respond to opportunities and threats. Uh, vigilance, ambiguity, prediction. This is the trinity underlying much of <laughs> much much of our cognition and emotion as human beings. Um, introduce a lot more ambiguity. The humans go nuts because they can't disambiguate it. Uh, doesn't take much. Right? Um, if you really, if you want a taste of what I'm talking about, in the, in a limited, you know, with a limited scope, you can just dip your toe in. Um, just load the Temu webpage, T-E-M-U, -E and have a look at that. And, you know, swim around in that schizogenic, psychogenic water for 20 minutes and see what happens to your mind. <laughs> I was joking with a friend that in my, I, I was joking, but I was telling the truth. It wasn't actually a joke that, um, in my Facebook news feed on my phone where I don't have FB purity, which I strongly recommend for anyone who uses Facebook on a computer, uh, there are advertisements and they, um, are horizontally scrollable, so you can scroll them just by swiping 
uh, left. And I would see a string of 12 or 15 objects so completely incomprehensible that I have no idea what the fuck those were. I don't even know what class of objects they were. Are they weapons? I can't tell. Are they tools? Unsure. Are they something that extends the capacities of a computer? Can't tell. Um, do you cook with them? I, I don't really know. <laughs> Are they multi-purpose objects? It's not clear. I'm talking like 10, 15 objects in a row. I can't tell what class of object any of them are. And it certainly isn't because I'm not, you know, I'm not technologically astute. I've been a computer technician for more than 30 years. <laughs> um, I recognize most forms of technology. Now, I will grant you that there's probably someone you can put next to me who has enough specialized knowledge that they might recognize four or five of those objects to be able to tell what they are. Or possibly there are people whose categorical intelligence has been trained by Temu right? um, to recognize absolutely anomalous looking things. But if you wanted to drive someone batshit crazy, what you might do is just have artificial intelligences build a product catalog of 10 million items that don't exist are provocatively suggestive of actual objects but belong to no object class and then project that at a population 24 7. You don't need slogans. You can destroy their mind with images of things that aren't, you know. So I think the slogans will follow naturally. Um, and this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, where if, for example, you can affect the foundation, okay, if you can affect the foundations of cognition, which primarily have to do with, for example, telling what things are, what is that? You know, I have a long discussion with uh, someone I'm close to the other night in which they complained that when they tried to figure out what <laughs> what is motivating their decisions um, the common way to phrase the question is why did I do something right why did I do something I did bond with this person, not bond with that person, defect from some friendship, etc. Um, they couldn't find, they, they completely failed to, under, to find any evidence of being able to understand why anything had been done. And, you know, if you focus the mind on a deep enough aspect of its own origins and, and functions, you're going to get nonsense if you try to force it <laughs> into a category. You're going to get nonsense, right? Because when you go really deep, you have problems like, I don't know if I know why I did anything, but who is it that is asking? And why are they concerned with that? Like, if I'm trying to figure out why I did something, why am I trying to figure that out? Also, this implies the existence of two me's, the me who does things and the me who disambiguates the doings later. Um, that's going to set up a system of mirrors that will eventually produce feedback and, wow, is that going to go sideways if we're not really careful with it? Um, if we're looking at the superficial... Uh, situation. You know, I went to the store because I needed some milk. That's not a problem. <clears throat> I washed the clothes because they were dirty. <clears throat> I wrote the book because I felt inspired and curious and wanted to have an adventure. Right? All that stuff works. But if you want to know the, the actual reasons, like down deep, good luck. Because you're going to run into <laughs> that W in the beginning 
of the most of the you know six of the seven question words in English. Right? That you you divide yourself into one who is asking and one who is answering. And unless you're very clever um, and skillful and creative, <laughs> that's not going to fly. <laughs> so if you can mess up the features that humans use to determine the category of something, right? If you can fuck that up at its basis, then you can, you've got a free ride after that. Because if they can't determine the category, they cannot detect a threat, right? Their threat detection architecture in consciousness will fail a lot of the time. And it'll fail more the blurrier the category of what or who becomes. Blur those two categories, you've got a perfect attack on (laughs) the unfortunate representationals who are subject to the such manipulation. Um, It will fuck them up. And that's a lot easier than launching nuclear weapons, so you can be absolutely sure that since the United States has adversaries within and without, adversaries within the government who want, you know, slavery and control and prisoneering of a populace, and adversaries outside the government who want military power or um, freedom, right? They don't have to worry about the United States. They can't put an army together anymore. They got some missiles, but they can't fight a ground war. Um, all kinds of things become impossible. Right? So what I'm asking is that we help each other to stay awake because I think we're falling asleep in a trance in which um, the assets with which we normally d- y- uh, employ, the assets we normally employ to determine identity and thus to um, that fund our vigilance, right? One of the primary features of consciousness. Those assets have been compromised intentionally and um, unintentionally in the sense of behavior of like media organizations and stuff that didn't set out to fuck those up, but discovered that it was profitable to do so, right? And now, you know, fill banks with with that behavior. Fill bank accounts with that behavior. So we're not merely living in strange times, we're living in times where it's become nearly impossible to understand the answer to any question that begins with what or who. (laughs) They're, They're taking out, you know, they're taking out the question words one by one and replacing them with really blurry, half, you know, schizogenic, half psychotic, mirages um, forged by language and media. Good luck, humans. <laughs> Unless we help each other right quick, um, we're going to lose the capacity to help anything. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the bright side, I think we can teach each other to understand and respond to the problems we're facing. But we're going to have to do it for ourselves. No one's going to come along and help us fix that. We've got to do it together. And I look forward to the grand experiment of learning how to do that. And to future conversations. Thank you for joining me. Bye-bye for now.